We want God to be alive in this place. Let me tell you, he is here. He wants our praise. He deserves our praise. So let's give it to him with all of our hearts in this place. We waited for this day. God, we honor you. We've waited for this day. We've gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're seeing. Put your hands together. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart and filling every part of our praise. We want to fill every part of our praise in this place today. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face. standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. He's the reason we're singing. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. What's your request in this place of God? Are you looking for his power, his mercy, his grace? Put it at his feet today. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. seat this morning as we continue in worship. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Uh, whether you're here for the very first time or here for who knows how many times, we welcome you and we look forward to how the Lord's going to work in your life during our service today. My name is Charlie Gosnell and today I'm a representative of the missions team. And we'll talk about that momentarily. But our first announcement is about next week already. And it's the service on the square, which will take place at 10 a.m. Um, we're going to meet at the square. Bring your chairs so you have a place to sit. Uh, bring your picnic lunch with you. Or you can, if you don't want to do that, there's plenty of restaurants around the square, as you know. And so after the service, we're going to have a, a time of fellowship together. It is a great time for the church to be together, to fellowship together as we meet in the square. And, and people are going to have an opportunity to see us at work. And so we invite you to come back next Sunday for the service at the square at 10 a.m. I am a part of a missions team here. And our 
function is to oversee our missionary programs and our mission agencies, our missionaries in, in particular. Um, and we want to promote that program to you. We have many, many missionaries and they're scattered here at home and around the world and they're all part of our help in fulfilling the Great Commission. And so as we represent them to you, we want to bring them up forward to you so you'll think about them and you'll pray for them. And on behind me should be Ken and Renee Dockery. They are with City View Mission in Cleveland. And I, I told them first uh, in the first service, I wasn't sure, I couldn't make up my mind whether they were part of our Judean ministry or our Sumerian ministry as we do their Great Commission. And so they are there in Cleveland. They go. They have a church that they run there that they serve in, and they are also out on the college campuses. And so they're just one of our missionaries, and if you have questions about our missions program, the missions team is around, and I will be glad to send you to one of them to get your question answered if you have questions about our missions. Is there anybody excited about going back to school? Sometimes I get a, a, you get a larger response from parents than you do from kids. And we're going to take time to pray for that right now. And so join us. Yes, sir. I'm excited to have a whole bunch of kids in the building every day. There's nothing that brightens my day like watching a four-year-old wandering down the hall staring at the ceiling. I just think it's awesome. Like, like we all need to have that kind of adventure in our lives. And, and it's amazing. We have with us uh, today uh, the new principal at the high school for Medina Christian Academy. And uh, his name's Sean Easterling. He comes from Pastoral Ministry. Would you welcome him to first today? <laughs> Sean's just going to share with us a little bit about what's going on in MCA, and then we'll be praying together. I think there's some days I wander around and look up at the ceiling wondering, <laughs> wondering what's going on. What a blessing it is to be with you today. Uh, it was just a blessing to be in the first worship hour, and, and you guys do a great job, by the way. Thank you for leading us in worship. Uh, and just to see your faces, and I think the parents, you're all excited about school starting back. Maybe the students, not as much. But um, as Pastor said, I, I've got an experience at both in pastoral ministries and in education, Christian education. And uh, God, I know without a doubt, called me to come to Medina. It's a great story of how God led me to this place and to come to Medina Christian Academy as their high school principal. A lot of change has taken place. Obviously, uh, we've done a lot of interviews this summer for new employees. I'm one of those uh, that came in as a new employee. This will be my first year there uh, and then they I hit the ground running and I'm not stopped it just seemed like we were interviewing more for teaching positions and uh, specialist positions uh, so a lot of new people obviously we have a new building um, at the high school and I would encourage you to call and make it a, an appointment to come and see that building it's just what God has blessed us with is just incredibly awesome and you've got to see that and then it's it's a change for our students um, anytime there's that much change going on our students are going to, to experience that. And many times we say that younger people deal with change better. I don't know that they deal with it better. They might just deal with it a little quicker uh, or they just don't show it as much. But change is hard for all of us. And so that's going to be a difficult process. Uh, we're not hiding that we know. We've got some hurdles to, to jump over as we begin this new year uh, with all the change that has taken place. First and foremost, my ask of you is your prayers. We know that our number one responsibility is the spiritual formation of the students that God has placed and blessed us with at Medina Christian. Uh, we would fail if we had uh, incredible academic scholars and we did not teach them about Jesus Christ. And so I pray for my teachers every day uh, that in that classroom, even in the hallways, that they will be able to uh, be an example of the love and grace of Jesus Christ. So that spiritual formation of our students, first and foremost. Obviously, we want them to be great scholars. So we've done our best to hire the very best people to teach that curriculum. And then we want to do this with grace. Uh, we know that our students, many don't come from Christian homes. Many come from broken homes. Uh, many of our students are brand new to Christianity and are coming to a Christian school because there's been a great change in their life or their family's life this past year. 
And so we know that there's going to need to be a lot of grace that's shared as well. And a couple of terms that I toss around a lot is we want to do it with excellence and we want to do it with accountability. Uh, you know, so pray for us in that role uh, that we will be, as Paul said, you know, follow me as I follow Jesus Christ, uh, that we can be that for our students. I value your prayers, and I will be happy to tell our staff, faculty, and our students, Medina is praying for you. This church is praying for you. And uh, that will give us a great deal of assurance and confidence as we move forward. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. For those of you who don't know, Medina Christian Academy came from this church. We started it 40-some years ago, and uh, we're excited to still have the partnership with them, work together with them. We are grateful for Christian education, and we have many people who are part of that. We also are grateful that we have all kinds of people who follow Jesus who are serving in the public schools and who are attending the public schools. We, we need to take Jesus into the, the public school arena as well. We have families who homeschool and uh, kids who are homeschooled, and that's another excellent opportunity as well. So we're not just going to pray for MCA today. We are going to pray for MCA, but we're going to pray for all of our teachers, all of our students, and ask that God would be glorified in and through all of them as, as we step into this, this new school year. So let's pray together. God, we just want to celebrate you and who you are. We want to praise your great and glorious name. Uh, thank you, God, that you are glorious, that you are great, that you are good. And God, we, we do ask for Medina Christian Academy. We, we thank you for that environment of Christian school where, where the staff are intentional about their relationship with you and investing in students. And we're thankful for, for students who know you and for those who don't know you who are in this environment. God, we ask that you would be exalted, that you would be glorified, that, that grace would flow, that truth would be taught clearly, that that it would be a greenhouse environment for, for these young people to grow and thrive and flourish in their faith. God, we think of those who are in public schools, and we thank you for the, the teachers and the staff and the students of public schools, God, who are part of this local congregation. Thank you that they get to take Jesus with them every day into that environment. We pray that you would be lifted up by their attitudes and their actions and that, that the name of Jesus would be made great um, even in the, in the public school environment, God. And thank you for those parents who are choosing homeschooling, God. And we just pray that you will empower teachers and empower, empower the kids, God, to seek after your heart, follow after your heart. Uh, God, we, we want you to do an awesome work for, for your name's honor and for your name's glory. God, thank you again for the opportunity that we have to partner together in ministry, uh, in, in schools, in the community. And God, we pray that, uh, that you will do the things that you want to do. And, and God, we give you praise now that even in this short time of prayer together, You've already heard, and you're already answering, you're already doing things that we can't do, but only you can do, because you're a powerful, glorious God, and we give you praise for that. In your awesome name we pray, amen. Thanks, church. Thank you. Yeah, it's great. Let's continue in worship. So will you stand with us? God's uh, character... His mission is endless, and so we have a new song to put on our lips today. It's called Hymn of Heaven. And the chorus says, there will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. We will stand face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy is the Lord. But I love this song because this anthem says, so let it be today that we shout that hymn of heaven. With the angels and the saints, we want to raise a mighty roar. Church, we don't want to wait for eternity to give God the honor and glory to his name. We have the opportunity to do it right here in this place right now. So as you catch on to this tune, please sing with us. How I long to breathe the air of heaven where pain is gone. Mercy fills the streets to look upon the one who bled to save me and walk with him for all eternity. There will be a face 
So let it be today. God, we know that you have given us a promise for eternity, that you will forever reign. But God, we have a purpose here in this place today to live for you a transformed life. Help us understand the gospel and live it out. But Jesus, in this place, we give you glory as the one who conquered death. The moon and stars, they rest. Morning sun was dead, the savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him. Romans 5 says God demonstrated his love to us, and that while we were still sinners, we cursed him on that cross. He came and he died for us. One final breath he gave as heaven looked away. The Son of God was laid in darkness. A battle in the grave. The war on death was waged. The power of hell forever The stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome. Now death, where is your sting? Our resurrected King has rendered you defeated forever. 
Today, help us to live differently in spite of it. We look forward to that day of joining you. Amen. You may go ahead and have a seat. I was thinking earlier today about the fact that um, the Bible tells us that God inhabits the praise of his people, right? So when when we gather together. And when we celebrate him, I don't understand it fully, but somehow God's presence comes in a special way. He delights 
when his people get together and celebrate him. And thank you so much for being a part of that celebration together with us today. As we, as we continue on our lifelong journey of worshiping God and bringing a praise to him. Um, I want to ask you this morning, who are my coffee people? Who are my, my, my coffee people? Some hands went up really, really fast when I said that. That's good. Someone who's obviously had their coffee, right, uh, today already. Now, so some people are so much so coffee people that this is what their, their day looks like. Number one, they get out of bed. Number two, they drink coffee. Number three, they wake up, right? Um, most people wake up before they get out of bed, but, but coffee people apparently need that. Um, some people love coffee so much that they just laugh when somebody says they don't like coffee. It doesn't even make sense to them that somebody else would not like coffee. Now, go ahead and laugh right now because I don't like coffee, right? Like, I'm, I'm, I, I don't even like the smell of coffee. I'm not interested in coffee at all. Some of you, when I said that I don't like the smell of coffee, like, you can't even process that. You're like, like, you are nuts. And that's fine. I, I'll go with being nuts. I, I'm, I'm good with that. Um, let me ask you this. Is there anyone that you're afraid to tell when you're out of coffee? Right? Sometimes that becomes an issue, right? Grandma's got to have her coffee or whatever. I don't know. You know, in the morning. That's good. Many people uh, think that coffee is an essential part of their life. That is, that uh, coffee is essential to them. I want to ask you today, what else is essential to your life? What are the things that are critical for you? All through the series on today's truth, we've been reminded that what you believe doesn't change the truth, but it does change you. In other words, what you consider as essential for your day is going to determine your priorities. Or what you have time for. Um, we're doing this series in part because we want to make sure that our priorities line up with the truth. Otherwise, we're investing ourselves or allowing ourselves to be changed by things that are not God's best for us. And so we want our essentials uh, to be lined up with God's purpose and God's plan for us. If you're new with us today, again, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We want to invite you into a journey where we experience and share the hope of Jesus together. Uh, at first, we believe that, that God is the creator of the universe and everything in it, and that we will be most content in our lives and most confident in how we live when our lives are in line with the truth given to us by that creator God. That's why uh, we have this series called Today's Truth. That Today's Truth isn't anything different than it was in the past. It's, it's the timeless truth of who God is and all that he is. But it is just as relevant today as it was thousands of years ago. We've been kind of going through a simple outline. There's one God. And that one God shows himself to us in two ways. He's revealed himself to us by all that he's created, and he's also revealed himself to us in his word. And that God exists in three persons. God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Spirit, and he wants us to be forgiven. We've been working through those three united persons of the Godhead uh, most recently, the, the fact that God the Father directs the plan and God the Son accomplishes the plan in that. And this week, we're looking at God the Holy Spirit. And God the Spirit empowers the plan, and he produces boldness in our lives and for us. We're going to start today in 1 Peter chapter 1, which is where we've been the past several weeks, as we look at, at the three persons of the Godhead, God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, in Peter, Peter is writing this letter, and he's writing it to people who are following Jesus, and they have been sent all over the world uh, by persecution. They've been scattered because of persecution. And so he writes this in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And then in verse 2, he lays out the triune God, God the Father, God the, the Holy Spirit, who he mentions second, and then God the Son. 
And he says this, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God's the Father is the one who directs the plan. In the sanctification of the Spirit. God's Spirit empowers us to be made clean and set apart to serve God. And it says, for obedience to Jesus Christ and sprinkling by his blood. Jesus gave his life for us. He paid the price for us. He accomplished God's plan and God's work. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit today. Let's, uh, let's pray together and ask God to teach us. God, we come before you today because we need you. We come before you today because we must be humble before you. Our agenda, our plan, our purposes, the things that are rolling through our minds right now, God, we just want to lay them before you and ask you, God, to take your purpose and your agenda and your ideas and your truth and write them deep on our hearts so that your truth changes us so that we can have that that peace and that confidence that we can only have when we surrender ourselves to you. God, thank you so much that you're with us today. Do the work that you want to do. In your awesome name we pray. Amen. Now the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is, is part of the Godhead. He is a person. And he does all kinds of different things for us. And, and so we're going to talk about four of them today. Uh, kind of as a survey of what the Holy Spirit does. He does many more than that. And normally when I teach on something like this, what I like to do is just grab one text in Scripture that teaches the truth and kind of go through that. But there's a lot about the Holy Spirit that's scattered throughout the Bible. And so we're going to be jumping around a little bit today. If you want to open your Bibles and you want to follow along and flip back and forth, awesome. You got nibble fingers, great. If not, it's all going to be up on the screen for you today so you can follow along that way as well. The first thing we're going to talk about the fact is that the Holy Spirit convicts, all right? The Spirit convicts. In other words, God's Spirit is at work in you before you become a Christian. He is the one who helps you realize your brokenness and your need of a Savior. And John chapter 16, we have uh, Jesus talking, and as he's talking, he explains how the Holy Spirit does this. It says in verse 7 of John 16, Nevertheless, I, that's Jesus, tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. Now, we know from the context that when he's referring to the helper, the helper is the Holy Spirit. That's who he's talking about. He says, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So there's three different areas of conviction that come from the Holy Spirit that Jesus addresses specifically here. The first one is sin, and it's, it's simply because of the fact that those who don't believe in Jesus have the Spirit of God pointing out their sin to them and making them aware of their own sin. The Spirit provides that conviction in our lives. Then the, the next thing he convicts is concerning righteousness. Though Jesus goes into heaven, and as he goes into heaven, he sends the Spirit, and the Spirit makes us aware that not only are we sinful, but that God is perfect, and he's flawless. And he makes that aware uh, makes us aware of that by the Spirit, um, even when Jesus isn't on the earth. And then he says it's also convict concerning judgment, and that is this, the, the impending or future judgment that each individual is going to face, and it's made clear to us by the judgment that God has executed in the past and in the present and the predictions about what he's going to do for us in the future. So, so the Spirit of God brings us to a point where we have to identify the fact that we're separated from God and there is a need in our life. We are, we are not whole without something to transform us and to change us. And 
the good news is that God has good news for us in the middle of our conviction about our sin and God's righteousness and the judgment that is coming. The good news is called the gospel. And I just want to lay out the gospel for you very clearly. This is the most important message in Scripture. This is the most important thing we need to know about God. And the gospel is simply this. God created us to be with him. God wants us to have a relationship with him. But our sins separate us from God. And our sins cannot be removed by our good deeds. We can't do enough good things to make ourselves clean in God's sight. And so Jesus had to pay the price for our sin. And in doing that, he died and he rose again to accomplish that. So that everyone who trusts in him alone has eternal life. Jesus made the payment for sin. And it's through faith in his work for us that we get to experience eternal life. And that life starts now, and it lasts forever. Maybe you're here today, and you understand that you are separated from God because of your sin. And you maybe have never heard of Jesus dying on the cross, or maybe you have heard many times before, but today it's connecting for you. And you're like, you know what? I need to receive the gift of eternal life that God offers to me. You can do that simply by confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart. You can pray and, and say something like this, God, I thank you that you designed me for relationship with you. But my sins separate me from you. And I can't do enough good things to cover up for my sin. Thank you. That Jesus paid the price by dying and coming back to life. He paid for my sin. I trust you. I put my faith in you. And I receive that gift of life that you offer to me. Eternal life that starts now and lasts forever. It's with, with a simple confession like that. Believing in your heart that, that you're saved. You're changed. And... And that spirit who was convicting you then does the next thing that the spirit does in our lives is the spirit seals. When you receive Christ, when you embrace by faith what he has done for you, the spirit seals you. God does something special in you to give you a guarantee. Ephesians chapter 1 talks about this. It says this, In him, or in Jesus, you also heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. That's what we just laid out. The gospel. And believed in him. That's your decision to trust in him as your savior. And he says, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Here's the thing. When you trust Christ, God gives you the Holy Spirit and that's a deposit. That's what that word guarantee means. It's the same word as we would say when you give earnest money to somebody when you go to make a purchase. That's, that, that's what that word was. It's, it's a deposit. So God gave you a deposit when you trusted him by faith. And he said, there is something more coming for you. It's the inheritance of the glorious kingdom of God. And this is my deposit to guarantee that for you. That gift is the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the Father's salvation deposit in your heart and in your life. So the sanctifying work of the Spirit begins with conviction. And then through faith, He becomes the deposit guaranteeing the full work of God in us. And today, God loves you so much that he has laid out a plan for all of us to follow. And when we do that, that's when we come to find completeness and peace and confidence before God and in how we live our lives on a daily basis before him. So the Spirit convicts and then the Spirit seals. And when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, the Spirit then also equips. The Spirit prepares us 
for what he's calling us into. He begins by teaching us the truth. In John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, uh, we see how the Spirit helps us and leads us into the truth. It says this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Okay? So here, he's beginning with this point. There's truth and there's lies. Right? And lies are going to come from the evil one. They're going to come from evil spirits. And the truth is going to come from God. So, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the spirit of God. By this you know the truth. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So if someone is saying that Jesus was chosen by God and set apart by God to be the redeemer for us and for our sins, that comes from the spirit and that's the truth. But then it says in every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. You cannot, you cannot follow the Spirit of God and reject the deity and the authority and the saving work of Christ. He goes on in verse 4 and says, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So that spirit who comes that lives within us and seals us is greater than the one who's in the world. They are from the world. That's the lies, the evil spirits. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. But he says in verse 6, we are from God. Everyone who receives and accepts what God has to offer them in Christ, we are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. If it's in Christ, it's the spirit of truth. If it's apart from Christ, it's the spirit of error, and we need to follow the truth. Now, now here's kind of like an underlying thing for all of this. God's spirit always works in harmony with God's word. Everything he says, everything he does is in harmony with what he teaches us in scripture. That's why we talk about the word of God so much as a church. That's why we invite all of you to every day open up your Bibles and read it and study it. That's why we have a Bible reading plan as a church. It's not because if you come here, you have to follow our reading plan. Just, we just want to make sure you're in the Bible. But if you don't have a plan to read God's word, then you're probably not going to do it. So we want to encourage you to invest in it. So we have a Bible reading plan. We've been talking about this. We have books for sale out there in the atrium, and a bunch of you bought them last week. I'm so thankful for that. Today, I just wanted to take a second and talk to you about the, um, the app version. It's the exact same study. It's the exact same passages, but you can download an app, and I use the app. And I just want to show you here. So there's a couple different versions that you can do with the app. This is uh, just some screenshots from my phone. On the far left side, this is what pops up when I click on quiet, on quiet Time on my phone, is, is the commentary version of the Quiet Time. It's got the passage at the top and then some explanation about what the passage means. When I click on Psalm 53, 1 through 6, the second screen is what pops up, the white screen. And so I can read the text, and then I can go back and read the commentary to just give me some details and background information on the text. And then when I click journal, it takes me to this screen, which is on the far right, where it says about the text and how to apply. This is where I can type into my phone the things that, that were pointed out to me by the text about who God is and what he's like. So, so this is from yesterday, and, and I read the text in Psalm 53, and I wrote, there's one God, and nobody is righteous like he is. And... And then the application is down there at the bottom, and, and I get a chance to write down the application. Now, the benefit of this is when I read, it's good, but when I read and then I process and start to write some things, that really helps it stick with me, all right? So that's one version. The other thing is uh, the interactive version. So if you see on the, 
on the left screen, you see the commentary at the top and interactive. So that was the commentary. This is the interactive. And this is more interactive, like there's a question and answer as you go through the text. And this one has, you know, read Acts 4.12. So you click on that, and Acts 4.12 pops up. And so you can kind of work through that and, and type in your answers there. And then the, the right-hand side is the prayer journal that goes along with this. And I'm in the process of building my prayer journal. Um, and so you can, you can add prayer journals, and you can add requests to those prayer journals, and you can use that to help you pray through things. But I just wanted you to see uh, how that functioned. Um, some of you might be interested in, in using the app version as opposed to using the, the book version of that. We do all of this because the Word of God teaches us the truth, and the Spirit of God agrees with the Word of God. So we need the Word of God in our life to help us grow in our relationship with Him. He teaches us the truth, but then He also gives people and abilities. And that's an amazing thing about what the Holy Spirit does for us. God has been using His Spirit to provide abilities for people for millennia. 3,500 years ago, Way before Jesus, God, by his spirit, gave special gifts to people. Exodus chapter 35 talks about it. Moses had been given instructions from God about building a tabernacle, a place for God's presence to dwell, and for for the worship of God. And when he gave instructions to Moses about building that, he gave them people to do it. And Moses talked to the people about that in verse 30 of Exodus 35. Then Moses said to the people of Israel, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and has filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge, and with all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood, for work in every skilled craft. And he's inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, the son of Ahizamach, the tribe of Dan. So, so they had, Bezalel and Aholiab had, by the Spirit of God, been given the gift of craftsmanship. Verse 35 says, He has filled them with skill to do every sort of work done by an engraver or by a designer or by an embroiderer in blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen or by a weaver or any sort of workman or skilled designer. So the Spirit of God had had literally empowered them to have these gifts so that they could build the tabernacle so that the people could worship God. Now here's the thing. If you have a relationship with God, if you have received the gift of salvation from Him, The Spirit has come to live within you and seal you, but he's also given you gifts. You have have spiritual gifts from God that are to be used to serve others and to bring glory to the name of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4 says it this way, As each of you has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So God has provided specific people and specific roles, and he has provided abilities that he's given to people. Some of the people he's provided are prophets and apostles and evangelists and pastors and teachers. We get that from from several points in the New Testament. Um, And then he's also provided abilities to, to all kinds of different people. Abilities include words of wisdom, exhortation, faith, service, giving, administration, uh, hospitality. There's a lot of different uh, gifts that God gives to people, and they're different, so we all get to work together as a church to do the things that God calls us to do. You have gifts given to you by God to serve him. Now, if some of you might be aware of what those gifts are. Some of you might not be aware of what gifts you have to serve God. And I want you to know in your online notes this week, I provided for you um, uh, an online spiritual gift survey. And you can take that spiritual gift survey, and that might help give you an idea 
of what gifts you might have. There's also a downloadable PDF version. If you'd rather not take a test online, that just download something and do it on paper, you can do it that way too. But you can discover what your gifts are, and then you can use the gifts that God has given you to serve Him. So my question is, how are you using the gifts that God has given to you to serve today? We, uh, we had Vacation Bible School a few weeks ago, and we had a whole new group of people. We had a bunch of people who have been serving for a long time, but we had new people participate in serving with Vacation Bible School. And it was fantastic. And one of the things that I've heard from a lot of those people who are new was like, it was great because I had fun doing it, like it, it fit me, but also I got to connect with so many people and get to know people. And now I feel like I have deeper relationships with people at the church, which is part of the joy of serving God together is, is when we do that. So I want to encourage you to, to jump in and serve with us. There's a lot of ways that you can do that. And um, we, we have opportunities in kids' ministry and youth ministry, worship arts. We have, we're looking for life group leaders and outreach and people with administrative gifts. There's all kinds of different ways that you can get invested and get plugged in uh, to serve here. So the Spirit equips us to be able to do that kind of service. The last thing that I want to talk about here is that the Spirit fills. And this is something that we all need every hour of every day in our life. Because this is what enables us to be godly, to be set apart for him. Um, you've heard people say before, probably, Christians are hypocrites. That's why I don't like Christians, right? Well, the Spirit of God is to help us to not be hypocrites. It's to help us to be honorable in the way that we live and how we speak and how we carry ourselves and, and how we serve. And the Spirit gives us that ability to do that. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about the filling of the Spirit and what that looks like. Verse 15, it says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. And do not drink wine, or do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit of God. What does it look like when you're filled with the Spirit of God? Verse 19, addressing one another in psalms and hymns, in spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So when we gather together and we sing, that's allowing the Spirit of God to flow through us. We don't have to gather, gather together to sing, though. You can do that, whether it's beautiful or horrible, you can do that on your own, too, right? Because that's the Spirit of God working through you. But then it goes on, it says, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not just singing praise, but it's also that thanksgiving is going to come out of your mouth when you're filled with the Spirit. Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Humility is going to be a characteristic of how you live your life and how you walk when you're filled by the Spirit of God. So when the Spirit fills us, He changes my attitudes and my actions. And um, we're not going to turn there today, but Galatians chapter 5, it's in your notes, verses 16 through 26, compares and contrasts when you live by the Spirit of God and when you don't walk in the Spirit of God, but you walk on your own in the flesh and do your own things. What it says in Galatians chapter 5 is that when you live by the Spirit of God, that you don't need the law. You don't need someone to tell you what's right and wrong. When you're living by the Spirit of God, what you're doing is going to be good. It's going to affect other people well. It's going to be healthy for you. It's going to give you confidence in how you live your life. When you're walking in the flesh, what you're doing is going to be hurtful to other people. And there's a list in this text of, of different characteristics of walking in the flesh. And then there's a list of different characteristics of walking in the Spirit. And when you let the Spirit fill you and empower you, the gentleness of God comes through you. The kindness of God, perseverance comes through you. All those different things. But that's all in Galatians 5. If you want to look at that sometime, that's a great study on, on what it should look like when you are being filled by the Spirit. But the last thing that he does is he galvanizes my speech. And this is something that is so important for each of us. Um, in Acts chapter 4, there's an account of Peter and John. They had been 
they had been proclaiming the good news. And the religious leaders found about it. They didn't like it. They called Peter and John in, and they had a conversation with them. They said, you need to stop talking about Jesus. And Peter's like, yeah, it's not going to happen. <laughs> but then what they did is they went and they got together with other followers of Jesus, and they prayed. And, and in Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 30, we hear what the prayer was about. They prayed scripture. They, they were thankful for the work of God. And then in verse 31, it says this, And when they had prayed, the place in which they gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Church, we have to pray so that we're filled by the Spirit, so that we have conviction and confidence and power to speak the Word of God in a world around us that is so desperately longing for words of hope, for words of truth. They need that from us. But we can't do that on our own. We don't have that capacity. We have to have the Spirit empowering us to do that. Anything good in me comes through the Holy Spirit. So I must lean into him. I must be crying out to him and asking him to do his work in me. It's not just personal, though. It's corporate as well. Anything good in us comes through the Holy Spirit, and we must lean into him. Church, we've, we've got to be people who pray together and and we do we pray in all kinds of different contexts and all kinds of different ways of church but we're looking at adding another one uh, just because we, you can't pray too much right so right back here used to be our worship arts pastor's office when we get a new worship arts pastor he's going to be down the hall over here this room here is going to become a prayer room for the church all right and what i'm hoping to do is to have you in that room praying during our services first service second service and if people need someone to pray with they know where to go they can walk in that prayer room and people will be in there ready to encourage them and to pray with them and bring whatever it is before god because god has the power to do amazing things so we're in the process of working through that setting that space up but also i'm looking for people to say, you know what, pastor, one Sunday a month, one service, I'd be happy to be in there. I'd be happy to, uh, to be, be praying during the service. You'll be able to hear the service. You'll be able to see what's going on. Um, but to be praying and asking God to do the work that only he can do is such an important thing uh, for us as a church. The Spirit convicts. He calls us to the point where we know we need salvation. Then he seals us and he equips us and he fills us, and as he does that, that transforms our lives. It sanctifies us. It sets us apart to serve him. We're going to close the service today with communion. And there's a lot of ways that we can approach communion together. With our focus on the Spirit today, I want to remind us that taking communion together does not bring honor to God when we're doing it on our own strength and with our own desires. Only through the Holy Spirit living within us and filling us can we truly honor our Savior, Jesus Christ, the, the one chosen by the Father to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Let's pray together today. God, we want to celebrate you and your work and your truth. And God, we thank you that you knew we needed the Spirit of God to empower us. And so you gave him to us. You, you allow us, God, to be humble before you and allow your Spirit to do your work in us and through us. And God, we entirely rest on you. God, we thank you for the convicting work of the Spirit in our lives. We thank you, God, that that you convict us of sin and you offer us good news that you have forgiveness available to us. And when we receive that gift, God, you, you seal us. You, you give us a deposit of the Holy Spirit to guarantee 
a future inheritance that's glorious in Christ Jesus. But God, you also equip us and enable us and you fill us to do your work in this world today. God, we humbly surrender ourselves to you and we ask you to do that work for your name's honor and glory. Amen. We're going to spend our time together today now being thankful for the cross and the work of Jesus Christ. Just a quick reminder to you that the bread represents the body of Christ. Jesus, the creator God, became a man for us, gave his body for us. And the cup uh, represents the blood of Jesus Christ, the, the only thing that could pay the price for our sin he gave for us. And in taking these elements, we are reminding ourselves again of our desperate need of Jesus to be our savior from our sin. And we're also reminding of ourselves of a glorious future that is secure because of the work that he has done on our behalf. So this is a time for you to humble yourself before God. Ask God, confess your sins before God, refocus your mind on him, ask him to fill you, and let the spirit empower you today to bring glory to God as you remember his work on our behalf. So we're going to distribute the elements. We're going to focus our attention on the cross as we do that. And then we'll take the elements together. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. I say upon that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They
this chorus. we do want to celebrate you together this morning. The Son of God came and he gave himself humbly, taking on the form of man, be, becoming a servant. And God, we are so grateful today for the, the body of Jesus Christ given on our behalf. We give you praise. Let's take the bread together today. And God, we celebrate not just the body, but the blood shed on our behalf. You paid a debt that was insurmountable for each of us. And God, we celebrate that the blood of Jesus Christ, the, plesh, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, paid our sin debt before you. And Reveal to us an opportunity, God, to have a restored relationship with you. And we are so dependent on that and so thankful, God, for what you have given to us. Let's take the cup together with gratitude. God, one day, our eyes will be fixed on Jesus Christ and and, and we'll see him face to face and it's going to be glorious and we are so grateful for that but God you're not ready for that day yet because we know from the scripture that you're patient you want all people to come to repentance and to the knowledge of the truth so you've left us here on this earth for the purpose of representing you in this world, of lifting up the name of Jesus in this world. So God, would you please empower us and fill us by your spirit to boldly take Jesus Christ everywhere we go. We prayed for the schools earlier, God, but there's communities, there's workplaces, there's, there's family get-togethers, all these different things, God. We want you to be honored and glorified in, in every single part of it. So God, fill us and empower us on an ongoing basis, God, to bring honor to you by how we carry ourselves, by how we live our lives as wise before the God who is the author of truth and the author of life. We as a church, together, God, want to give you praise. And God's people said, amen. Well, our hope and our prayer for you today is that you can say it was good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And so next week, we'll remind you one more time that we're going to be at the square.
for our service on the square. It takes place at 10 a.m. Bring your chairs, bring your lunch, and plan to spend Sunday morning with us in the square as we fellowship and worship together. Have a great day. You are dismissed.